Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to the Printed Circuit podcast, where we discuss trends, challenges, and opportunities across the printed circuit engine industry. I'm your host, Dev Chavez. Today, you're in for a big treat, as we're going to discuss manufacturing-driven design. And with me, I have two industry experts, Max Clark, who is Product Strategy and Technology Director at Siemens, and Jerry Partita, Vice President of Technology at Summit Interconnect. Thanks for being here. Would you give the audience a brief introduction of yourself and your background of what you bring to the table, respectively? So, Max, let's start with you. Sure. I, uh, I'm Max Clark. As stated a second ago, I'm responsible for product strategy and technology, specifically in the areas of manufacturing uh, release into the design process, which is a very something that I hold very close to my heart and have for over three decades now. That's my primary responsibility and roles within the Siemens product families. This fall will make 40 years I've actually been in the industry. Um, I started off in uh, Evercharles Test Equipment and then worked for Optratech, which becomes the, the leader in CAM plotters where Max and I met. So two years in electrical test and 10 years as an application engineer, I actually started working at a board shop. Once I started to understand the actual process, even, up, even though I was an application engineer for 10 years, I really didn't know the manufacturing process. For a couple of years after working at a factory, it finally, it finally dawns on you how this all works. And at that point, I got involved with an IPC and, and the standards and have been involved from the application engineering of equipment that, that did CAM, right, to actually doing manufacturing, to doing the compliance end of things and being in the standards. That uh, and engaging in the whole electronic industry, whether it's aerospace, space, commercial, uh, telecommunications, it's been a very rewarding career in working and helping provide insights on what works how to apply the rules for um, greater success, greater reliability in products. As I'm entering the last phase of, of a career in this industry is to uh, now dispense and share that knowledge across my company and the industry to make things as best as possible for reliability and technical capabilities. This is kind of been my uh, where I'm at and where I've gotten in the four decades I've been doing this. Awesome, awesome. So let me start this podcast with sharing... Uh, some experiences that I've seen over my three decades of doing board designs and my evolution is specifically when we think about how we've come along from back then when, when the three of us first got into this game and, and now where we're at today. What I've seen as I've evolved, especially from company to company and going to different trade shows and, and speaking and talking is I'm amazed on how many times I, when I ask the question, how many of you know your internal design process? Do we even have it written down? Is it even captured? And it's amazing to see how many hands don't get raised. How many people don't even realize that they're just flying ad hoc and not having a process captured. It's outdated. I've seen this. If they are incorporating or account for DFM, it's a manual approach to how they're doing it, which is very time consuming and prone to errors because it's a human doing it manually. And then you get where I've seen where you had the old saying that you're tossing data over the wall or tossing garbage over the wall and hoping for the best. And then you, you complain about why am I getting technical queries? Why is my, my job on hold? And, and then from a fabricator's point of view is, you know, why are you penalizing me? Because I'm asking intelligent questions about your data that that's put, has potential errors in it. And you're taking that data and going somewhere else with it because I'm you know, trying to adhere to industry standards. And when you talk about like from fabrication's point of view, you got imbalanced stack ups, you got fab documents that contain errors that conflict with each other. You get industry specs where the design doesn't even meet the spec. It's, it's calling for a class three, but it's designed like a class two or class one, you know, and, and, or you have data that's missing holes, uh, missing drill holes or holes that are supposed to be plated. They're non-plated. And, you know, so that's just from the fabrication point of view. Think about assembly. Now you got assembly drawings that have errors not conflicting or, or conflicting with industry standards, IPC standards, and component placement issues, whether they're too close, especially when you start thinking about pick and place and flying probe testing and stuff and component issues. And then you get into soldering, solder paste, solder stencil issues. So many issues when you think about design for manufacturing is not in. So, you know, I at least want to start with that. And Jerry, Max, you know, you guys have worked together for quite some time ago. You know, while you've gone through your professional differences in different directions, why do your paths continue to cross? Sure. I mean, there's, there's lots of reasons for that. First of all, you know, Jerry and I started working at Optratech years and years ago. When we started, there was no such thing as really any type of 
DRC, let alone DFM, in printed circuit boards. When we first started working for Optrotech, the real thing that we did is just to digitize the board so we can put it into a panel and play with the data so that we can manage the manufacturing processes, Jerry, right? DRC came up like maybe a year after that. People started coming up with ideas on what to do there. So from my, from my experience, Jerry, when we first got started in this industry, we were a fancy step and repeat type of uh, product. I mean, it was very advanced, but DRC wasn't something that came along. It actually came around after the idea of redigitizing the data. Some very clever people said, hey, guess what, guys? We can run some DRC on this data. And why do we want to run DRC on the data? Because at the time, the EDA tools that were sending us this data for manufacturing the manufacturing areas were having to deal with problems that they wanted to detect. Jerry, I mean, that's that's kind of like the short story of my... Wasn't there only like three DRC checks when we first started? Right. It was, I, I, like, it was like facing <laughs> with an annual ring. I think that, that was that it. That was it. And now we're in like well over 100 different DRC checks. But things were a lot easier back then. When I first started this industry, most boards were through hole and there was surface mount. And, and I remember like a lot of articles about how to do surface mount on two sides of the board. This was like this was like the cutting edge. There's a lot of things. The boards are very active now. Before they were just like this place where you kind of essentially bolted down components and then they would connect to each other through through copper and holes. But now it's a very active device where the impedance, the tuning, and the timing between these things become uh, more complex. And the density of features that were in there are so much complex. When I when I we hire new people in our industry. I feel so bad for them because there was like, I only had to learn three DRCs and that was it. And then things came one at a time as we were listening to customers about what did they need. You need teardrop? So what is this teardrop? Are you just making a bigger connection? And so it was like, okay, then we'll add teardrop. And then in our career, we're lucky that we got exposed to request one thing at a time to the point now that they're so complex and they're so interrelated that we look at designs. Can you do this? Can you do this? Can you do this? And, and it's funny is that people will call and say, hey, can you do a two and a half mil line? He goes, yes. Okay. And, Hello? You still there? I, and then you find out they put it on a two ounce copper layer. And I go, would you think that I could do two ounces on two? Well, you said you could do it. I go, well, I, you didn't hear me say, but it depends on your copper weight, right? So, so the things have gotten more complex and, and they're more interrelated than when it first dreamed up. And one of the problems that happens with printed circuit boards if it worked once, there's a process and, and they just keep doing it. Well, it worked once, it's worked before, and then they'll just keep designing it. And then you start looking at it and you go, you know, we get like 25% yield building this thing. And it's funny because like nothing happens until you go, hey, uh, your price went up 4X. And like, what do you mean it's 4X? I go, we're getting 25% yield. So I have to run four times as much. So we're passing on the savings because this is what it costs. And what happens is that's, that's when the question on DRC comes up and say, hey, what can we do to look at the design to design it better? Oh, well, let's do that. Let's go back and look at the design and apply rules that are accepted by the industry that say, if you follow these rules, they work out with a much better outcome. So there's this one situation where we had, we had to do that. A customer was getting 25% yield because they didn't take into consideration into consideration how much we compensate drill sizes for, and then a drill size for a hassle, and it was five lamination cycles and double blind. They assumed all spacing was based on the finished hole size. I'm like, no, we don't drill that size. We drill bigger, and because you have tin lead reflow, it's a much bigger hole, and your drill to copper distance and finish, which you thought was 10, is actually six, and that's why the yields are bad. So when we went back and applied the rules, the yields on that five lamination cycle went from 25% to 88%. And it was just working collaboration wise and, and using the rules and, and making it work. And, and like he went from like 9,000 dangerous locations and he calls me and I go, I can't fix this anymore. I, I did the best I can. I go, well, where are you at? I go, I got 30 locations at eight mil drilled of copper. Final lamb? He goes, no, 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 on one of the subs. I go, fine, 30, I can live with those risks. So if you go from 9,000 on the final drill to 30 locations on the first drill, yeah, yeah, I can live with those risks. And so we're using the, our tools to tell us this is what's in the design and this is what we needs to be fixed. Or you, you can relax your, your tolerances or your requirements. And so when I did the uh, PCB West, the lunch and learn, my presentation was, if you're going to bend the rules, bend your compliance. And then I went through the standard 
design requests that they tell us to do, but they don't design to it and say, okay, well, now you got to you have to change the compliance that I have to build to because you never designed to it in the first place. So we've, we've come to a very complex, very small components, very dense connections and, and the activity of the circuit board, right? If you have a long barrel, you have to back drill it, then you have to worry about how big is the back drill to other features. All the DRCs become more and more important that the, the end, the board is, can be manufactured with a reasonable yield and that it's going to be reliable in the field when it's finished. When I hear you talk about instances like that, that's real world issue that you see on a regular basis, Jerry. It really has me thinking about that, that book, Max, that, that you had wrote. It was the Printed Circuit Designer's Guide to Manufacturing Driven Design, which I think is an excellent ebook that's available on iConnect 007 for download. And it's got a lot of great content in there regarding manufacturing driven uh, design, and specifically regarding DFM. And, and when you think about DRC, so when we use the term DRC, let, let me just ask this question. If what started was referred to as DRC, how did we use the acronym DFM BEGIN, you know, the use of DFM BEGIN? Jerry and I both lived through this, and I carried it on when we, when we went into the Valor Age of CAM, when we started the Genesis project that, that I think, Jerry, you're still using Genesis there to this day. When we were with Optratech, we inherited the term DRC because we got that from the EDA companies. That's what they called it. That's what we called it. We called it DRC. But then when we started doing more sophisticated checks, Jerry, when we when we jumped to that fourth check, okay, we went from the three to the fourth. We said, whoa, we're really, we're really flying now. But obviously, we've added more and more checks. And we wanted to create a differentiation between what was DRC and what we were really working for, Lord, was this design for manufacturing persona, where it wasn't just as simple as checking to see if the line and the spacing and the annual rings were correct. Quite frankly, while that's important, that's pretty pretty basic. If Jerry wishes that that's all that he cared about, as he alluded to earlier, we've now run into hundreds of checks because there are impacts in the in the manufacturing process. There are design characteristics, design behaviors that directly impact the process that Jerry is speaking of. And it can be in a very negative or a very positive manner. We're looking to locate the negative ones. And so we started to use the terms DFM, and we began to look not just at pass and fails, but at at ranges, trying to look at a histogram approach. Because for a manufacturer, knowing the number of occurrences where something is maybe less than ideal is important. Because if it's a few items, it's one thing. First of all, it's a few items, it may be very easy to fix, okay? But if it isn't repairable, it's a few places where if it's all over the design, the impact is going to be a lot grander. I got a great example, and I got feedback from it just last week. So we have a customer, the semiconductor boards. They make semiconductors. They have to test them. They have these little reference boards about day big, and they, they literally make like, They need about 10. They usually order 20. And they make these boards and they literally just put the chips on, fire them up. They go, okay, the the noise level's this or the speed's that. And they're done. Literally sometimes in 10, 20 minutes, they're done. They've they've done the evaluation. Now they're going on to the next part of the development of the chip or the testing of it. So these chips are really small and they got like really fine lines and spacing. And so what, what you can do is you can make really small holes, small annular rings, and make it in one lamp cycle and get it done. But it's it's not for the field. It's just to test the chip. So they used like a 6 mil drill and a 10 mil pad, 062, eight, six layers, punch and crunch. And they only need it for a chip that's only like 0.2 inches by 0.2 inches. But the designers use those pads and those drill sizes across the entire PCB, the same line spacing, and it's the risk of failure blows up exponentially, right? Because they're doing it because, hey, this is, no one's told us any different. There was two different groups. I went to the two groups. I said, listen, this is the risk it takes to build a board. If you take the risk and it's only a 0.2 inch by a 0.2 inch risk area, chances are we're going to be fine. We're going to be fine. But outside that area where you have all of this room, just go to a standard drill and pad size and a conductor with We're going to hit our yields. You hate when we're late. You hate when we're short quantity because we lost so many boards. If you do this, this will impact. You'll get full quantities every time. 
there's less chance of a remake. You're going to get it on time, full quantity. So this was last summer that I did this. No news is good news. They call, oh yeah, it's so much better now. Our yields are so much higher. The customers are happy. Everything worked out. So it's a matter of taking an understanding, like Mac was saying, when you look at the risk in the histogram, you go, well, this is very risky, but I have it everywhere. Or I can just reduce it to a small area and go, I can live with that risk because the chances are that it's not going to happen all the time. And I might lose 20% of the boards, but in the other case, I might only get 20% of the boards to actually pass because I have a high risk over a wider area. Sometimes when you speak to the design organizations, as Jerry was talking about, they just don't think of it necessarily. It's what I find when I speak to designers, I always tell them, guys, we build the layer. We don't build the area, right? So you have to think of the whole board and treat it as a board, not say, well, everything on your five and five everywhere, let's just do it everywhere, five and five. If, if you don't have to, don't. And you know there are designers, especially like with BGAs, where the fan out becomes really wicked. You might get three mil line, three mil space, even smaller, but then it backs out to something that's more manageable. Those are the kinds of designs that Jerry would like to see, as opposed to everything being routed to the least common denominator. As a designer, my biggest pet peeve is understanding the decisions you make at the point of design and their impact downstream. I'm surprised on how many designers just don't realize, they don't get it, or they don't, they don't see that far. They only see what's on their plate, which is their design. Not consulting with the fabricator or the manufacturing fabricator assembly up front as part of the key stakeholders in that initial process and throughout the process is, especially if you're in today's complex designs, you're, you're setting yourself up for some serious issues, if not failure, if you don't bring those stakeholders to the table. And especially, you know, as Jerry mentioned, with some of those very complicated designs that you're up against, when you think about the, that triangle with yield, reliability, and cost, where decisions or design-based decisions are built around balancing yield, cost, and reliability for the overall product design. Max, you even have a picture of that in that the book you authored. It's a really great picture and with a little quote there. And that manufacturing-driven design facilitates a communication that enables you know, your manufacturer to increase yield and reliability while lowering costs. And in the end, that's what you're after. And that's what you should be after from an engineering perspective. So let, let me get back to DFM, that, you know, especially regarding as we're walking through this, this process here. You know, DFM stands for Design for Manufacturing, but if manufacturers are performing DFM, isn't that too late in the process when you think about when we're doing it? So, but Max, you're laughing, Max, but I'm like you know, teeing this up for you, so. Yeah, absolutely. We, I look back at time, at, you know, through history, as, as Jerry alluded to, I, I'm 30 years just in Siemens between the, the Valor Mentor Siemens uh, Trek, five years with Jerry prior to that at, at, at Optratech. You know, I look back at what we called DFM. We call it, we called it DFM when we created our Genesis project to create a differentiation from DRC. That was where it was it was kind of born. But if a design is being validated by a manufacturer, which is what a lot of designers feel, they this it's the my manufacturer is responsible for the quality of the of the product. Then really, isn't DFM Shouldn't it really be called something like manufacturing despite your design? What we're asking Jerry to do is like, here's your, here's the design. You have to build it. And so what Jerry says, okay, if that's the case, I'm going to run DFM on it so that I can figure out how to manufacture this. As you said, it's important to get your, your, your suppliers early on in the discussion. But what Jerry's team is doing is saying, look, guys, I know you've sent us to this to it, but here are the things that we can do if you can do it to the design prior to us actually manufacturing this that would improve the yield. Can you do these things for us? The earlier I can get that done, the easier it is for him. So ideally, you would like to see this done at the design, at the design level, have the designers running. So what we're seeing more and more OEMs and design organizations doing is purchasing tools such as ours to perform this analysis ahead of being released into manufacturing. And by the way, I would like to suggest that if more and more companies do this and more and more companies work with their suppliers, 
you'll get fewer of these what people typically refer to as technical queries, TQs. TQs are the spike in the in the in the ground for every design that goes through. If Jerry has to issue a TQ, it doesn't go anywhere until that TQ can be lifted. And if if you just cut that by half, if Jerry could just cut all his TQs by half, man. We don't have to pay Jerry as much. That, that's, that, that's what it comes down to. No, no. You'd actually probably make better, higher quality, first-time products to begin with. And you don't have to change anything. You're just getting better data. <laughs> and Max and I have talked. I go, in reality, in a board shop where we take the data and use CAM to tool the data, we're just a, a printing for service. We, we just take your data, step and repeat it. And make images and the drills to connect them and the solder mask, the legend, and all that stuff. If the designs were perfect, we wouldn't have to check. We wouldn't have TQs that average, like for military customers, about two or three weeks to get them all resolved. Commercial guys, it's all over the map. It's like, don't do anything unless they tell you to do it. Other ones are like, just do it and just t- don't even tell me. You know what to do. Just change my data and make it happen. Other ones, just do it and let me know. And then there's other things you will not change anything. I will send you new data. So it depends on which market you're in. But one of the things is nobody checks their work. They have notes on their drawing. They have whole counts. They have impedance tables. They got dimensions on there. They don't check. They don't check the dimensions if they actually are correct. And the thing that I learned from Max is, you're telling me the guy that does lay out the design is not the same guy that lays out the outline of the board? He goes, no, that's a mechanical guy. I'm like, that's not the same guy? No wonder these things don't match at times because one guy... One guy does a chamfer from a different angle and length, and another guy does something else, and all of a sudden, we do a board, we rat it out, we go, oh, there's exposed copper. And they go, this is the right dimension on the print, but they ran the copper past the edge, and now it's like, man, and it's always our fault. It's like, well, you should have caught it when you reviewed my design. We're responsible for catching the mistakes. If, if we don't catch it, so it's your fault. It's yours. Don't ship them to me. You think about where we've come to this day and age from back in the day, now we have the ability to do a digital twin with our different domains and the multi-disciplines attacking it. When you think of MCAT and ECAD, you talked about the board outline where it starts in mechanical, gets hand off to electrical or ECAD, and it's taken from there. And, and having a digital thread to be able to integrate and cohesively integrate, it's beyond me how many companies are still doing this in a manual approach and how they hand off data. So part of that too, the, the digital twinning is, you have to collect the data so you know that it does work or doesn't work. A lot of people do not collect the data. We do. We collect the data and we're like, who says I could do this? Let me show you the yields when it's at that spacing or this drill to copper distance based, on, based on, on the data collected from registration. We can show you. You gave a formal annular ring and asked for a class three. Here's the actual results from all our data showing us that we're holding tangency at five. It's not like, well, I feel like I can get a formal annular ring and call it class three. Nope, we actually have the data says, no, you're not making that. Then there's the relationship of things sometimes, like solder mask to etch, and whether it's a solder mask defined pad, or there's there's the relationship that you guys have to be concerned about, that oftentimes the design tools and the designers have no real concept around. Right, and, and a good one is the solder mask and etch defined pad, which is not a design rule flaw. It's just no one knew any better. So one of my favorite ones is about once a year, I'll get a board. He goes, we're having assembly problems. All right, call me and we'll look at it. So they'll call me and they go, what's the part number? And I'll pull up the part number and I'll see a, an outer layer with the BGA that's got copper pore flooding in part of the BGA. Some of the pads are edge defined. Some of them are solder mass defined. It's the same solder mass clearance. So the solder mass clearance in the ground plane has a bigger surface area for the solder ball to spread out on and the other one is an etch defined pad that probably over etched a little bit so the pad that solderable land is smaller than they expected and you're like oh and they go what do you mean by oh i go you have solder mask and etch defined pads all the balls in that component have to collapse at the same moment which means all the pads have to heat up at the same time and the same rate you have a problem all the ground plane on the outer layer is a heat sink it doesn't get up to the point of melting. All the S ones melted and they're trying to collapse, but all the other ones in the ground plane are, are holding it up high. Yeah, so what happens is they get bad connections. They get cold solder joints. There was this one case we had this customer. Everything worked. They did the board. They assembled the board. They tested the board. They did vibe and shock everything. Somebody goes, hey, we got to do a 12-foot drop test. 
So they took a board, dropped it from the height of basketball court, and this component ripped off. And they go, oh, you've got black pad, you've got solder joint problems, and this huge investigation goes on. And so luckily, this guy came with the component and the board it came from. And after showing him all our data and all our stuff for like four hours, I go, let's go look. He goes, let's go look under the scope. So he gives it to me under scope, and I'm looking at it, and I could see that the pads got ripped off the board, right? So if you have a bad enic problem, it breaks from the pad to the, the ball. I go, this connection was so good between the pad and the ball. It ripped it off. You can question our laminate as far as being laminated, right? But you can't question the enic now. And then I looked at the board, and it had, like, ground planes that were solder mass defined that were the same size as the etch defined pads with the big solder mass clearance. I go, this is you. And so uh, when I showed this guy, he goes, my people should have caught that. He goes, that's, you guys, you guys are exonerating. I got to go through the process. But, but it's, it's like one of those things. Nobody knows because that solder mass clearance that's in the ground plane that's bigger and the solder mass defined that's bigger than the pad with the edge defined pad, it's not a design rule error. This is where experience comes in and knowledge. And you'll actually, literally, somebody has to design a board, get in trouble to realize, don't do that again. When I think about going back to the process is that even if you have a process in place, my question is then, are you getting continuous feedback from manufacturing to feed back that loop back for that information from manufacturing back in into your engineering process to understand, to continuously evolve, to be optimized and be better? And I think that feedback loop is missing in a lot of cases. Sometimes it gets even missed by us fabricators because it's like, I want five pieces six fit on the panel. So for the machine gods, we always throw extra panels out there because if you try to do enough panels, the machines will eat it just to spite you. So what happens is you, all right, run, run three panels. I need five, it's six fit on the panel, so I'm running 18. So you run 18 panels for five, you lose half of them, nobody notices because they ship the order on time. Even though you lost nine out of the 18, they only needed five. It is not very apparent that that's a problem because you were on time, full quantity. Now, take that same order and it's a thousand pieces and it six up and you're losing half. That gets noticed really quick that there's something seriously wrong. And so this is kind of one of the things that makes it hard with designs that are, that are poorly done. Depending on the quantity and how much up, you may not detect that it's a serious problem and they have to deal with it. But I was just doing it with, uh, with some of our people at the facility I'm at. I go, let's take a look at all your defects of the year. This customer, the number one defect is one fourth of everything that you built, this one customer. And I go, if we list all the customers that had a defect, there's like 40 or 50 of them, but one of them is one fourth. Let's go look at the design and see what's going on. So that's data, that's information. You gotta collect the data and then you gotta, you gotta have the will to go and analyze it and start looking for trends and opportunities. Because a lot of times you tell a customer, especially if you've been building boards for them for years, like, hey, you need to change this. Like, no, we don't. We never, you guys never complained before. But then when you show them the data, this is what we're suffering. This is what we can do. Let us help you understand where the pain point is and what can be done to improve the quality we're building the boards. And a lot of times it's like, oh, is that all we have to do? We can do that. Just like I told you that story about the semiconductor customer, right? They, they didn't know that they were impacted. They were just saying, well, you can do that, right? Well, then I'll do it everywhere. I was like, well, no, we just want you to do it in an area that's, that's smaller than my nail and my pinky. For the better part of 20 years now, DFM has been used by design organizations to validate producibility of design or PCB design prior to production release. How does manufacturing-driven design, or MDD, compare to the practice? MDD represents kind of a, an evolution in the way DFM was implemented in the past. And it kind of plays into what Jerry was talking about earlier. What we basically did at first is we took DFM that the, that the manufacturers were doing and we left shifted it into the design space. And then the design organizations were kind of left at their, on their own determining what, these, uh, what the analysis values should be used to validate the design against. When in fact, in, in actuality, the manufacturers would typically know this much better, obviously. And so the idea of MDD is to shift this all the way up to the designer space. And to get it done during the design process. So you have not only validating the electrical uh, requirements for the design, but you also are validating the manufacturing requirements for the design. What 
Summit Interconnect brings to the, play, to the table is the ability to connect with them in order to pick up their DFM profiles and put it in the hands of the designer. So as the designer is routing the board, not only are the electrical requirements being validated, but also the manufacturing requirements are being validated, which is really what Summit Interconnect, Jerry specifically, wants. In his own discussion, he talked about how we find things in the production, and now he has the ability to go in, modify the producibility requirements, the DFM profiles, republish those, and then those are automatically submitted to all his to all his clients. So when they validate their designs to be manufactured in his facility, it lessens the likelihood of something like that happening again. And I think that's really the evolution that we're looking for, the, the designers to really have the responsibility of ensuring that the quality is in their design to begin with. That's the idea. Now, there are standards that are out there. The IPC, for example, has a standard set of, uh, of classifications and densities. It's, there's a breadth of information inside there. In fact, part of the challenge is there's so much information, it's, it's hard to get it wrapped around a designer's head to begin with. So there are out on the uh, PCB flow platform that we have today, already there are templates of IPC standards so that if individuals that may want to utilize MDD within our tool sets or within PCB flow, they can utilize there, get started there as their initial way of of uh, performing this, this type of analysis, that will aid, certainly aid some of circuits independently anyway. What I love about PCB flow is that it's like tool agnostic, if I'm right. You can take any of your outputs and check the data, check your data so you don't have to you know, be in a Siemens ecosystem or Cadence or Altium or Zookin or Orcad or whatever. It, it allows you this platform to take industry checks that are validated from those suppliers and you can check your data. I mean, Jerry, that's pretty much what you mentioned, Jerry, about getting that upfront low-hanging fruit and pick it off. With IPC establishing PCB flow parameters based on the design guidelines, IPC 2221, 2222, 2223, 2228, if designers want to achieve the shift left, they may not know what fabricator they're going to. So if they are able to take the IPC rules that are based on producibility levels, there's, there's A, B, and C. A is the easiest, C is the hardest. And if the rules have been established by the IPC divine rules, they could take their designs, throw them in PCB flows, and get a feedback for that low-hanging fruit based on just IPC rules across the board and do that before they finish the design. Because most designers, we don't get them until they're actually finished, which means the revs cut. And so if we find anything, they're like, oh, it's going to cost us so much money. And like some of the big customers, it'll cost them $30,000 because we found a dimensions wrong. They got to get it through. They got to get approved by a body of people. And then it, they're selling it to some other contractor. So they got to go by legal reasons to go to them and get them to buy it off. And they're like, well, how did this slip through? Who? Yeah, so this, they're all, it's, it's a painful process for them to go, hey, we found a mistake. We got missed. And, and it's a long, lengthy process. So. By using PCB flows based on the settings that IPC has set up, they can do that shift left, and when they're done, it's going to work fine for any fabricator. Keep in mind, we have, all, we have that available also on our enterprise products as well. So even designers working on-premise have access to those uh, same rules. I think that's all we have time for today. Thank you again for being on the show and sharing your insights and experience. To our audience, Tune in next time for more trends, challenges, and opportunities across the printed circuit engineering industry.